Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world on Think Tech Live, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Akea. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper, and the title of today's episode is Creating Community for Unity in Ukraine, Civil Society Solidarity to Serve People. And joining to me today is a Natalia, the co-founder of the amazing nonprofit Romada. Natalia, thank you so much for joining us today here on Think Tech Live. Thank you very much, Joshua. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. We know it's a very important time at this conflict as we're on day 98 of this horrible war. And with Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, people around the planet that are dedicated to democracy and freedom have begun campaigns of compassion to serve Ukrainians facing the brutal bombing and barbarous war crimes. We know Ramada, meaning community, is one example of engagement with courageous campaigns to assist people on the front lines of the unprovoked war taking care of the immediate and most pressing needs today and rebuilding in the future. Can you share some of the work that you've been involved with so far? Oh yeah, absolutely. Romada has been formed as a nonprofit here in the US in 2017. And the primary purpose at that time was to publish the first Ukrainian newspaper on the West Coast of the United States with the same name, Romada. And uh, when we've been publishing this monthly newspaper already for will be five years, uh, this December that we will be celebrating, uh, very early on, the, the reason behind having the newspaper was to create uh, this Ukrainian media space, right? So that we would give the local Ukrainian American diaspora a voice and bring the news, local news, as well as news from Ukraine. Uh, however, the, the, the organization also had a very significant charitable component from the very beginning. Uh, this war in Ukraine has been going on for eight years. It started in 2014. And as of January, even before the full scale invasion has started, there were approximately 3,000 children in Ukraine that were orphaned, that their fathers or mothers have died in the conflict, in the war in the Eastern Ukraine. And our organization was uh, doing fundraising and sending $50 per child for Christmas to these families. We've been doing this for five past years. Since the war started, we have quickly reorganized other activities on two major fronts. One is informational front, right? Because bringing information was very important and we sort of were always on the forefront on bringing the most important messages of what Ukraine needed at that very moment in time, right? Sort of staying even ahead of the curve. You know, we were the first one to be asking for preventive sanctions against Russia uh, when everybody was here. No, 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 no. You know, we cannot do that unless the war starts. But the Ukrainian government was saying, do that now before they start killing, bombing us. And we were actively promoting that message, uh, you know, asking for um, sh sheltering the skies for uh, for a no-fly zone, right, which has really never happened in the form in which all Ukrainians around the world were asking. But these were some of the messages that we were promoting early on. And, and you know, so informational front, because we have this newspaper is super important. We have some very important political observers and journalists from Ukraine who have column in other newspaper. We have local journalists. But you know, as when the war started, we understood that there will be a huge humanitarian crisis, uh, which we see unfolding as we speak. And we had uh, organized a major fundraising activity, and we were sending the, the other sort of uh, uh, thing that we do, the purpose of our humanitarian effort right now, is to send these mini grants, you know, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 to charitable organizations and volunteers in Ukraine on the ground uh, some of them in the war zones, you know, we were sending money to Kharkiv, to Dnipro. Uh, most of these funds go for women and children, for people who need the most uh, um, the, the help the most. And we're continuing, we're continuing to fundraise. We're organizing concerts right now. You can go to our website, homada.us, and, uh, you know, and see the list of, there's more than 50 organizations that we have been working with, sending humanitarian aid. And there's also, uh, uh, a, a tap for concerts, we're organizing this charity concert, all to fundraise, all to send humanitarian aid to those who are most vulnerable. We will definitely get into the concerts uh, a little bit later, but we also know Ramada reviews the current war crimes and international human rights violations, and then provides that holistic assistance to fellow suffering survivors in Ukraine. 
then we also know this week there was a very important case where for the first time ever in Ukraine, they actually did punish a soldier for a war crime. And it was actually a Russian soldier was sentenced to life in prison for shooting an unarmed civilian. And this was Ukraine's first war crimes trial since the invasion. And that sergeant was then sentenced to life. And then another situation just happened where a Ukrainian court found two Russian soldiers guilty of shelling civilian sites and sent them to 11 and a half years in prison. And this now is then the second verdict that's been handed down. Can you share some of the other war crimes that you found that have been taking place so far? Oh, we've, oh God, there's, you know, we've been hearing about them since day one, but most of them we have really uncovered when Ukrainian forces have liberated Bucha, Irpin, those little towns around Kiev, in Chernihiv, and uh, you know we've we all have seen the horrific images, right? We've seen them on CNN of a man who's going on a bike and he's just being shot, or women with their hands tied behind their back being executed, lying on the sidewalks, or mother with a child lying on the sidewalk, right? Both being executed. These horrific images, but. What recently, there have been a number of reports that have been published already by Amnesty International, by Human Rights Watch, by United Nations. And uh, these, uh, these reports by independent investigators and reporters, they go, they document these things, they collect evidence. So all these things are collected and later on will be prosecuted in the court, in some international court. International Criminal Court is already looking into this matter. We heard about this, right? Because these cases have to be brought to justice. But very significant, I would say, in that regard, uh, just this May was published this report. It's an independent legal, I hold it in my hands. I want to show it to people, if people want to research, because this is very significant, big significance. It's an independent legal analysis of Russia's breaches of the genocide convention in Ukraine and the duty to prevent. And this was compiled by the New Lines Institute for Strategy and Policy. Three groups of experts participating in compiling this very comprehensive report. Uh, legal experts, there were some 35 plus PhD professors who are specifically experts on the subject of genocide and as well as independent investigators who went in and looked and, uh, at the body of evidence and linguists who have recorded the first uh, the, the testimonials of the victims of the survivors. And uh, the result, the finding of this report is quite damning because it says that the legal threshold of a serious risk of committing ge genocide in Ukraine against the Ukrainian people is met. And that there is a legal responsibility on the states who are part of this convention against genocide, which I believe was signed in 1954, if I'm not mistaken, is to prevent and take any action possible to prevent further genocide against civilians in Ukraine. And you know, when I was preparing for this report, I read this report, but I, you know, you you I I was reading also all other reports and when you read the information about these horrific crimes that were committed, you know, they're really gut wrenching, you know, your blood almost boils that atrocities like this could be happening, you know, and it's even difficult for me to say and, you know, retell you some of these stories, but I have to, we have to, because really, you know, so that people around the world understand that at this time and age in 2022, uh, that, that never again is happening now. And, you know, I'll just bring you some more examples that really sort of stirred me to the core. Uh, you know, in, in Bucha, for example, there was a case, and this is, uh, this is in this report, and this was reported by the Ukrainian uh, uh, ombudsman, uh, you know, who's the um, defender of human rights in Ukraine. There was a case of 11-year-old boy who was raped by a Russian soldier, and his mother was tied to a chair so that she was forced to watch. Uh, it, there was a case, and I think this is, there's probably a prosecution coming for this soon. There was a woman in Bucha. Uh, two Russian soldiers came to her house. They killed her husband, and then she was repeatedly raped while her son was hiding in the nearby uh, room. She managed to escape on the Ukrainian-occupied territory. But, uh, you know, this is just 
this is just two examples. If you read on there, uh, you know, there's another example where 25 uh, girls in Bucha were repeatedly raped and they were held for 25 days. And the message that was delivered to them by the Russian soldiers is we're gonna rape you that many times so that you will never wanna have sex again with men so you don't have Ukrainian children. Uh, and uh, you know, again, this is all documented. There's another very horrific case of uh, uh, about 350 people that were held in the basement, pretty much captive. Uh, 70 of them were children, uh, five of them were you know, uh, uh, toddlers, and uh, they were kept in the basement in inhumane conditions. There were no place for them to lay down. Uh, there was no toilets. The people had to use buckets. Uh, they practically had no food, no water. They couldn't step outside. Uh, Ten people died during that ordeal, older people, because uh, uh, people were developing illnesses as they speak. You know, there are cases of two twin brothers, 17 years old, just being executed, shot on the street together with their friend, 18 year old. You know, there was another a case and i have all these names you know all these this is all evidence now 14 year old boy who was playing soccer in the street his brother came out to grab him to bring him home uh his brother was shot in the leg and was trying to get back to the house and they shot the 14 year old kid so you know things like that that you read about and you really think how can this be happening right to the this is happening to civilians people who have nothing to do with the military uh it's just um really horrific crimes against humanity these are war crimes uh, because they are conducted against civilians you know if we take it one step further uh, it's uh, uh, you know the, the mass graves that have been discovered in bucha in chernihi uh, and you know i have to speak about this because i think this is a very important topic please remember that there is a very large territory in the eastern and southern ukraine that is occupied right now and the predictions are, and this is what people who are there on the ground, they predict that there will be a thousand buchas discovered when ultimately the Russian soldiers will recede and independent investigators will go in and take a look. This is happening as we speak. They are kidnapping Ukrainian activists, journalists. Apparently they have blacklists compiled. When they come to the territory and somebody who had even any relationship was pro-Ukrainian activist, journalist, uh, you know, served in the Ukrainian army. They grab these people, they disappear, they torture them. You know, there's there's uh, records of um, in horrific torture, you know, it's, again, that uh, that Russians are inflicting on Ukrainian civilians. It's, uh, it's really mind boggling, you know, uh, when you read these reports, it's hard to maintain for me to, your sanity. Uh, because, you know, it's been 77 years since uh, we've been witnessing the atrocities during the Second World War, and now 77 years later, it's that never again is here and in such, uh, you know, horrific um, forms that it's really difficult to digest. But And the points you're bringing up, especially you being there in San Francisco, we know that 77 years ago on June 26th, the world met in San Francisco to create the UN Charter to make sure that never again was not only a political promise, but a reality. And the Ukrainian's prosecutor general has been looking at many of the cases that you brought up. And they also point out that Estonia, Latvia, and Slovakia will be part of that joint effort along with that international criminal court. And another multilateral initiative, which directly supports ongoing efforts by the war crimes unit of the Office of the Prosecutor General of Ukraine to document, preserve, and analyze evidence of war crimes is also being created known as the Atrocity Crimes Advisory Group, or ACA. And what you're outlined is actually verbatim what is in the Genocide Convention. And after San Francisco in 1945, in 1948, there was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on December 10th, but the day before, December 9th, was when the Genocide Convention was created. And Article 2 has the five elements. And what's so important is you don't have to prove all five, it's just one. And of course, number A is killing members of the group, which you of course have documented and shared. B is causing seriously bodily or mental harm to members of the group, also clearly done. And then here's one aspect of C and D, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, and D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group which is some of the short stories that you were sharing. 
and E is forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. So all five elements, not just one, are clearly being met regarding genocide. And that's why it's so hard. I know you've been focusing on it since 2014 and looking at what's been going on, but most recently, we've really seen this intensification and the thought of seeing a thousand bukchas, of course, is so damning and alarming when we're here nearly 98 days into the conflict and almost eight decades later. Yeah, it's it's uh, really uh, horrific. I would say it's horrific. And, uh, you know, as you said, all five points have been pointed specifically more than 200,000 children have been forcefully deported from Ukraine. I think there were reports of that, right? So which clearly falls into the definition of genocide. And there has to be a genocidal intent, which was also proven in this, uh, in this legal paper that I was referencing. And please remember that six countries already recognized this war as genocide for, uh, against Ukrainian people. That's Baltic state, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Poland, Canada, and uh, I believe it's Czech Republic. And now I think it's turned for the United States to do the same. And this is a humongous task for other Ukrainian American diaspora to recognize that what is happening right now is genocide against Ukrainian people. So no one can ever deny it. And, uh, you know, and so that this can never happen again. And going back to maybe thousand of butchers happening right now, that's why it's so imperative right now that this war that Ukraine is waging is uh won quickly and you know we've heard recently from president zelensky he said if the world were to unite and really give ukraine the weapons that it's pleading for and has been asking for the past several months uh, and lend lease is obviously a huge step in that direction and all ukrainians are humongously grateful for that i have to say but they still ukraine still lacks heavy weapons the U ukrainian forces right now in donbass are, are heavily outnumbered by weaponry and by uh, sheer number of the soldiers that they are fighting. And, uh, you know, if, if Ukraine were to, un if the world were really to unite and do and give Ukraine the weapons and provided what it really needs and asking for, this war could be won in a matter of weeks, not months, not years. This is what the Ukrainian President Zelensky said. So that these atrocities stop, right, to leave these, these occupied territories are probably facing right now similar inhumane conditions. We know they are from reports that we're getting. And the way to stop it is to win this war. There is no other way around it. And to win that war is a couple of things. Weaponry, Ukraine really needs heavy weaponry, and there seems to be a consensus, but sort of what we hear from the Ukrainians on the ground, too slow, too little at a time. It's, it we needed, those weapons were needed yesterday you know, to defeat the Russians. And I also want to breach a, another very important topic, in addition that, you know, U Ukrainian American diaspora should really push the US uh, Congress to recognize this was genocide. Another one very important one is to recognize Russia as a state sponsoring terrorism. Uh, there are other countries, I think four other countries that fall into that category, uh, Syria, North Korea, Iran, and Cuba. And uh, uh, I, th I think there is a, a law that has been introduced already into the Senate by a couple of senators. And I think it's very important to pass that law because uh, companies and individuals, uh, as we find out, finding loopholes against the sanctions. And uh, by imposing that status, it would, in effect, close many of those loopholes. And also, it would be it would uh, further the effort to further escalate, uh, isolate, isolate Russia on the global, on the global state. Uh, so on, the, we, on the global scale, we've definitely seen that taking place. We know uh, Davos just took place uh, recently, and normally, if you're at Davos at the World Economic Forum, there's normally the front promenade. You're greeted by the Russia House, and that Russia House no longer exists. It was converted into the, quote, Russia war crimes house. And it featured photographs taken in Ukraine over the course of the conflict, looking at exactly what you've shared, rapes, executions, and other atrocities. And in that house, that's really where people gathered to look at what should happen going forward. Also, I believe Poland's head of state just recently visited as well. And really in Davos, that was really one of the main points at the Davos 
really World Economic Forum was looking at that conviction in the West and focusing on the importance of standing against dictators, and most importantly, the heinous war crimes taking place today. Yes, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I was also watching the news about the uh, the Economic Forum at Davis. Russia was not present there, and uh, uh, you know, I think it was very symbolic that the house where they previously hold, where they or previously always were participating, was called a war crimes, Russia war crimes. And uh, you probably heard that there was really uh, there was a lot of effort uh, to discuss what will it be like to rebuild Ukraine. But please, because we we cannot forget the damage that was done to Ukrainian economy is enormous. Right, the the eastern, the southern part which was, is the industrial part of Ukraine, it's pretty much destroyed. We're talking about the, you know, the, to rebuild the country, it will take hundreds of billions of dollars to rebuild Ukraine, and it's gonna take years. Uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's really horrific, uh, you know, as I say these things, and uh, there were talks about Marshall Plan for Ukraine, right? Marshall Plan, because uh, in, in some regard, uh, well, not not in we know that in all regards, Ukraine is the one who's defending freedom right now, defending freedom for on, on the global stage, uh, you know. And uh, so, uh, you know, talk, talking uh, just just going back to one more point, I think that is important when we talk about uh, uh, genocide and war crimes. Uh, I think not many people maybe know about this or maybe know about this, but just recently there was a Twitter from Wes Clark, uh, the retired U.S. general. And he was uh, really asking his friends in the U.S. to speed up the delivery of MLRS systems, the artillery system, HIMARS, that can uh, uh, shoot artillery longer range than what Ukrainian military currently has, because Russia is using these weapons. They are called um, uh, thermobaric weapons, or sometimes they are called vacuum bombs. And uh, these are really uh, the weapons that should not be used in a conflict. Uh, uh, you know, these, the, using these weapons uh, could be qualified as a war crime under the Hague Convention of 19, 1899 and 1907, because it basically sucks up all the oxygens. If the windows are not sealed out, it has, a, it has a, these uh, horrific uh, um, bombs uh, have a chance to basically permeate everything that is not closely sealed. And, cause horrible death and, you know, destruction, um, it, um, uh, fix, destruction pretty much to civilians. And they are using right now, the, this is what Wes Clark was saying, Russians no. are using this, these bombs right, right now in Eastern Ukraine uh, to ruin the villages. So that's another thing, you know, it's another sort of, uh, unfortunately, check mark or whatever you want to call it, line item. Uh, which is a, a, war, a war crime, crime against humanity, and it's unfolding as we speak. And uh, you know, I, I I cannot hone in again on the on the on the point that this has to be stopped, right? This has to be stopped sooner than later. The more this conflict drags on, uh, you know, the more butchers we will we're going to be discovering. The the more civilians uh, are going to be killed, right? Uh, four thousand, more than four thousand civilians have been killed already, and these are just uh, you know, and United Nations, this is the number that United Nations discloses, and there's always a small quote that's saying this is just the confirmed one, the, 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 you know, the, the, this, uh, uh, we suspect that the civilians death in Mariupol are more than 30,000 civilians, right? Today is the International uh, Children's Day, and uh, there are already 240 uh, kids died in Ukraine that are confirmed. I'm not mentioning even the kids who have been wounded. Who have seen, who have lost their limbs, right? I've seen, we probably have seen those horrific images of toddlers without their legs or their arms. So the way to stop this is to stop this war quickly. And if the world, the world were to unite and to provide Ukraine with the weapons that it needs quickly, that it needs right now in the front line, because there is very heavy fighting going on as we speak. No, yeah. as they pointed out, I, the one of the Ukrainian soldiers quote saying they're just raining down metal on us and talking about the stench really of the the death tolls rising with the supper temperatures rising as well and they described the tactics over and over again that they shell for several hours for three four five hours in a row and then attack and those who attack die then shelling and attack follow again until they break from suit again so it's this brutal tragedy of unparalleled savagery and what we do have to look at and what you are trying to share 
is that we must really bring an end to this conflict as soon as possible. And that more importantly, that the world, even though it has united a great deal, as we reach near the 100th day, it's important to make sure that Russia is held accountable for all of the war crimes it's perpetrating, that the evidence is gathered now so that we can make sure that it is never denied in the future, as we see too many times in history, those that commit the war crimes and tries to use the pen to then deny what has happened, denying what they've done. And what the final part though is to really come up with the international system that makes sure that never again will people from an, a sovereign nation be attacked by a larger power next door and trying to eliminate them. And I think one thing we can describe today is also the soccer team uh, was able to win yes. uh, three to one, yes. I believe. So they yes. have one more game to win so they would qualify for the World Cup. But they, they were there singing their national anthem. And of course, the national anthem has that important line of still being there and the nation being alive. And maybe you can talk about mm -hmm. that as we close out today. Yeah, and that was sort of a breath of fresh air, I think, for many Ukrainians. It was sort of that break that they all desperately needed. Those were those two hours of happiness, I think, as the president was saying, right? Because, you know, this is real brutal war that is going on right now, right? And just to have that chance to watch the Ukrainian team win and, uh, you know, hopefully qualify for the World Cup, uh, it really brought a lot of happiness, I would say, to people. So thank you. Thank you, the Ukrainian soccer team, for this. and. I also, you know, I want to thank you, Joshua, for giving me this uh, uh, opportunity because exactly it's getting close to 100 days and maybe some people, we don't see that many headlines already, you know, all the news because it's sort of yesterday's news. The war already is going on for 100 years, but uh, it, it's, it's important to keep it alive in the news and to bring to people all these stories of, uh, you know, of genocide, of horrible atrocities so that uh, you know people know we're really aware of what is happening on but more importantly that the world further unites provides ukraine what it asks for right listen to the ukrainian government listen to the ukrainian president what they need please provide them with what they need so that they can free free their land and reach this weak victory for ukraine right now it's a very tough tie, uh, fight uh, you know severodonetsk was pretty much the key city in Luhansk region was pretty much taken by Russian forces precisely for that technique that you were describing, right? They shell everything if they not, cannot take, uh, they, they just destroy it. If you cannot, they cannot win it, they just destroy it and then come and on the ruins, they put a Russian flag. That's what they've done to Mariupol. They could completely erase that city, uh, eradicate it, and they, they're doing the same now to Severodonetsk. So it's... Um, uh, you know, Ukraine needs all the support it can get on multiple fronts, informational front, right? Like yeah. us talking about it today. Oh, the so military much. front, uh, right. economic front in terms of aiding. And uh, again, thank you for giving me this uh, opportunity to speak about it. No, and we thank you so much for making time. And we also know that Polish President Duda made a visit to the Ukrainian parliament, one of the first heads of state to do that. And we know really the citizens, such of yourselves, are the heroes living bravely in the present and looking forward with hope. And we also look forward to talk more in the future about the concert and other important work that's taking place. So thank you so much for making time. And thank we you, will Joshua. continue this conversation. And thank you for creating community. Romada. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joshua. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.